night if you're in the Caribbean. Good morning, good afternoon, wherever you are in the world. My name is Shane Slater and welcome to our post-screening Q&A for our spotlight on Trinidad and Tobago. This is a special night for us. We got a lot of submissions from Trinidad and we, we decided that we really needed to have a special night to honor uh, what's going on in Trinidad. We really feel like there's a, a lot of strides being made in Trinidad's film industry and we wanted to support that and have a spotlight. And we have two special guests with us. We have the director of uh, Sins of the Father, Azriel Bahadur, and we have the director of Doubles with Slight Pepper and Party Done. Yeah, so let's get right to it. So I'm gonna start with Azriel, um, really powerful, striking film. And I love that it takes place in this very sacred space for Caribbean people, which is the church. And it's interrogating this idea of, of pastors who we sometimes you know, idolize and we forget that they're vulnerable human beings. You know? uh, what was the inspiration for telling this story? Uh, that's, a, that's an excellent question. Um, the inspiration for this, I think, so on a personal level, I love philosophy and I'm always, I'm fascinated by the concept of um, good and evil, and then at the end of the day, really justice. And, um, and it got me thinking, you know, we, we tend to put people up um, on, on really high pedestals, and we expect really, uh, you know, almost perfect behavior from them. They must follow all the rules. They must um, paint this image of a well-behaved, you know, perfect human being. But at the end of the day, they have, you know, feelings just like us. They have flaws just like us. And I really wanted to explore what it would be like um, for a priest to, you know, have to, I guess, put his personal issues aside and still perform his, his job. And it's not even a job, it's like a sacred duty because they take their oath very, very seriously. So that's the inspiration for the film. And um, I, think, <laughs> I think it even had me asking questions, you know, to myself, you know, if I was in that position, what would I do? And I still haven't come up with an answer. And Ian, with your film, uh, Doubles with Slight Pepper, you, you really get a sense that it's a very personal story and very specific. What was the background to this narrative? Yeah, yeah, it, it, it actually is a really personal story, but not in, I guess, the, the traditional sense. Like the, the relationship between the father and son depicted in the film is, you know, not at all the relationship that I had with my own father. Um, when I was, you know, you know, probably about 13 years ago or around, so my father was diagnosed with, um, with Alzheimer's disease. And if, you know, if, if you're, if you're familiar with Alzheimer's disease or you've seen somebody with, or have cared for somebody with Alzheimer's, you know, there's, there's no cure. It's essentially, there's no coming back. It's just how quickly are these people going to, going to go down? Um, and at the time I was, you know, I was living in New York and my family, my mother and my father were living in Toronto. And so I'd go back and forth a lot uh, to visit and to see how he was doing. And, you know, towards the end of his life, he had deteriorated to this point where, you know, he was no longer, it didn't seem like he was the person that raised me anymore. Um, and it was like, I was meeting him for the first time. And it's, it's that feeling that, I'm, that the film is really about. It's about trying to, you know, what it's like to meet your father towards the end of their life. So it's, it's that inkling that I'm trying to explore more. Again, even though I had a lovely relationship with my father, it's more about this emotional core that I was trying to capture with the film. And with Party Done, you're telling someone else's story. Um, and it's, it's the whole concept of Crime Watch is so mind blowing to me because it just so, feels so dangerous. And you decided to be right up there, up close and personal with Ian. What was that experience like? And was there any point at which you were like, okay, maybe this is, this is too risky. How was that whole process like? Yeah, I, there's certainly like a, I guess a, a naivety that I went into this project with because um, yeah, I, I guess I didn't know what to expect, but when we were actually, I, I don't know, maybe there was a piece of me that didn't think that Ian Allen really does those things. But you know, he'd call me at 2 a.m. and be like, okay, we're going out. And me and the cinematographer would would show up and you know, it'd be us and like a whole entourage of police. And the police come out and Ian comes out, they're all in bulletproof vests. They all have, you know, big guns. 
and it's me and the cinematographer with just like a camera and a microphone and you know, and we were in some really tricky situations you know honestly there were times where if when I look back I'm like those were definitely some I would I would approach it differently if now for sure in terms of personal safety um than I had it at the time but at the in the moment I really wasn't so concerned about safety because I was more concerned about what we were getting on on the camera um, and what was happening with Ian in those moments. Yeah, and he's such a big personality and he's he's has experience with production and so on. Was he very, did he try to be very hands-on with the, the filming and how you were portraying him and the story? No, you know, I, I, I give him that, that like, you know, credit is due, you know, where it's due. And he was completely hands-off in the whole, um, in, in the whole process. He gave us unlimited access to anything of all of his material, all of his archival material, to him, to his crew. Um, you know, he was down for it. He never asked for anything in return. Like we didn't pay him or anything, certainly. Um, and he was just, he was just interested in allowing me to tell the story that I wanted to tell. And I was not expecting it. I thought he would have been more hands-on in terms of wanting to see edits and wanting to be more in the you know, having some um, some influence in the film, in the edit room, and uh, frankly, that just didn't happen. Um, and and I appreciate that from him. And Azrael, you're dealing some with some heavy material, and you're working with these two actors. What was it like working with them and getting them, you know, to really dive into these this heavy subject matter and the philosophy and the themes? Uh, it was a it's definitely a journey. Um, but the the original script I had written was was something completely different. But the time that that film was shot was last year August, and that was like the 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 peak of COVID. Or well, I guess it was still bad. Um, so there were restrictions in Trinidad where the maximum amount of people that could be in a group, um, I think was was ten, ten or eight or, or something like that. Um, so when that happened, I I tried really really hard to like work around the production logistics, but it just wasn't possible. I just didn't seem worth it. So I, I kind of put archive that script and I went back to the drawing board and I wrote something specifically for two people. Um, so coming out of the gate, I knew this would have to be very intimate. Um, it would have to be very contained and it would have to be in a place that's sort of away from the public eye because, um, well, again, COVID, you know, pe people are, are, are wary and they, they're very, um, so, you know, seeing a group of people with like cameras and stuff, it, it probably just would not, you know, done well for like public image. Um, but then when the, the production started, <clears throat> um, it was really, well, first of all, the priest was played by uh, Damien Salandi, who was a, who was a bit of like a, a childhood hero for me, because I grew up seeing him um, reporting like the, the news, like weather. So when he, you know, auditioned, <laughs> when he auditioned for the side, I was like, oh, like that's, is that actual, you know, Damien Sani is like, yeah, and he was interested and he came down. And um, he he's like a, a powerhouse, a powerhouse of an actor. Um, his voice alone just grabbed me when I looked at his audition tapes. Um, excellent, excellent person to work with, very professional. And um, Darren, Darren blew me away. He, the original actor, we had selected, we had some complications and we had to um, find a replacement like within the last day. And uh, the casting director, Tristan Wallace, he had Darren in his back pocket and he said, um, let's go with this guy. And Darren came, he had probably a day or probably a night to you know, go through the entire script and internalize the character. And when he got there, he nailed every single scene. It was, it was so impressive. Um, he originally, he did, a, well, he still does it. He does a lot of spoken word. Um, so it, it, the biggest task for me was really just you know, channeling that drama into a more contained package for the film and he adapted so well it was so so easy to work with both actors and in general um in terms of like the subject matter it was it was very touchy because i had to sit and have a, a pretty long conversation with the, the priest of the actual church uh, because he had to read the script and give like the the thumbs up um, there was even a part at the end where you know at, at the climax where they the two actors like you know come into that disagreement i left it blank in the script because i originally i wanted to put um one word of like profanity there but then i said 
I don't think a priest is going to feel, you know, okay about that happening in his church. But when he read the script and I explained to him what I was trying to achieve, um, he was open to it. In the end, it obviously didn't make the cut, um, but it's, it is heavy. Like you said, Shane, it really is heavy. And I think it's, I think it's important that we, we look at these things with an open mind because, you know, like you said, it's, we're all human. You know, whether it be priest or politician or pauper, it, it really doesn't matter. We all have these issues. I, f I feel like in some ways, being forced to use a confined space can really bring out your creativity. And yeah, the yeah. confessional itself is, is such a powerful visual in cinema. I think it can really play with light and shadow. And could you touch a bit more on, on, on how you you know, when to, how that confined space really brought out some of your creativity. Yeah. Um, so yes, you're right. Working in, in a single space, it does. And I guess that's budget filmmaking, right? You have to find ways around it and, and be creative. Um, but yeah, so working in a single space, it, it brings restrictions, but it does, it does force you to come up with solutions, um, ones that you can't just buy and, and install, right? So um, with the confessional, that was very intentional because I wanted the, the film to have a very wide open feel at the beginning. And you could feel air and you could feel distance between the characters. So a lot of the shot sizes are very wide to probably almost medium, but then um, the shots get very tight because the confessional is, as you said, it's a very confined space. So it's almost like destiny forcing these characters very, very close to one another and having that you know, um, uh, accident take place eventually. Um, from a logistical point of view, you know, it's I I had this um, sort of behind the scenes thing for for some of my um, followers because everybody was asking, how did you fit all of that gear inside of you know that small space and it's a secret space and it's it, it was actually very easy because the confessional it's it's a T it's just you know ply and wood stitched together and then we we stick cameras and lights in there and then, and then we shoot um, so. I think the, the biggest factor that helped in, in terms of making it feel confined is the lighting. Um, my, my genuine you know, passion is, is cinematography. I have learned directing and writing and stuff out of necessity. So I really wanted to take my time with that scene and ensure that when you look at it, you can't tell it's just three pieces of you know, ply. It's a confessional and you, you get that sense of you know, claustrophobia. And Ian, you know, uh, Azriel mentioned some of the challenges of, of independent filmmaking. And uh, I, I want to learn more about your journey from doubles with Slight Pepper to now making Party Done. Has, has, it, has it become any easier for you? Um, how, how, how's, how has things changed for you as a filmmaker uh, after winning awards for Doubles with Slight Pepper and progressing in your career? You know, I'm still trying to figure that all out. That's like a really, really good question, to be honest. Um, it's certainly, things have gotten easier, but some things have remained the same. Budgets have remained the same. It's still really difficult to, to raise money and to get money to believe in these films that you're making. And most of the time, it's basically a lot of self-funding, honestly, um, or grants or whatever, because they're, there just isn't enough people that are willing to financially support the arts, I think. And uh, I would say specifically within, within Trinidad and a lot of other places, or even within the diaspora, um, you know, film in particular is such a, I don't even want to say emerging in new culture, but because it's not, like there is a history of film in the Caribbean and in Trinidad, but it's just not, I feel like it just hasn't really been exposed to wide audiences where, investors are, are able and willing and knowledgeable enough to come and to put their money into a project. So, you know, the financial aspect has become, you know, just as difficult, if not harder. What I will say is that, you know, I, I, I feel like I've grown as a filmmaker in that it's become easier for me on set to know what I want and uh, to be able to capture things um, and know, know when I have something, when I have a great moment to know what that is when you're seeing something on screen, or sorry, when you're seeing something happening before you. So I would say I've grown more confident and as a filmmaker, but behind the scenes, things are just as difficult uh, and really haven't changed from, you know, from the, from the short doubles with Slight Pepper. 
Okay, I'm going to move to some of the questions from the chat. We have a fellow Trini here and he's asking a question for Ian. So it says, Crime Watch appears to be concerned about violent crime. Did you think while you were working with Ian that he should also be concerned with some of the non-violent white collar crime? He said, in his opinion, it would be great to see those who rob our country's wealth, essentially creating the conditions for the ills he chooses to focus on also being highlighted. Uh, you know, that's a great question. Um, I, I think, whew, there's a lot, to, I have a lot to say. <laughs> and it would be great to, to hear, um, you know, Ian Allen's answer to that. I, I'm actually personally interested in that as well. What I will say is what I think his, his view on the show is, I think he's speaking for people that don't feel that they have justice in a really immediate way. Um, people can come to him that are uh, that are the um, the victims or the family of victims, and I guess victims themselves of violent crime. That has a really that has a much more immediate um, uh, impact, I, I would say. I think in terms of the white collar crime, you know, these are far larger systemic issues that I don't feel has been tackled in Trinidad. Um, I almost feel that those problems, these issues are bigger than Ian Allen. Um, and if people really wanted to confront these issue, these issues that the, uh, the question asker is, is asking about, it would lead to wholesale and massive change that would have to be done in Trinidad to really address uh, perhaps even the real sources of crime in Trinidad. Um, because, you know, I think, you know, in the film, and one of the interesting things that I learned about Ian Allen was why he does what he does, like what got him initially interested in it. And it was because of when he, when he was robbed, you know, many years ago as, as, a, as, a, as a young person, he was held up. And that was a pivotal moment in his life. And I think because of that, and he says it himself, like he's able to, uh, to understand what other victims of crime are going through in that moment. And just as he was looking for some sort of, some sort of, uh, justice, whatever that means now in Trinidad, because there's so many people without any justice. Uh, I think he's trying to, to achieve that. But at the same time, you know, the, the, uh, the statistics, you know, are, you know, paint a different picture if, as if Crime Watch is effective at all in terms of affecting crime in Trinidad, because the crime rate hasn't changed at all in the amount of, um, in the time that, the, that Ian Allen has been producing Crime Watch and doing his work. Uh, I wouldn't say that he's responsible for that, but I wouldn't say he's, you know, he's causing the rate to go down in any way. So does he have an effect on uh, a positive change on crime in Trinidad? I'm, I'm not sure, I question that. Uh, but he definitely does directly affect some people who, who are victims. As when I was watching the film, I, I started think about you know the whole the entertainment aspect of it for did you get a sense from the people who watch the show um are they really trying to make a change or are they largely watching it for entertainment what sense did you did you speak to many people who are fans of the show to get a sense of how how they're actually receiving what is happening on the screen you know that's a great question um, there's, I think the, the character, the person of Ian Allen, I, I kind of don't like calling him a character because, um, he really is, who he, you know, who he presents himself to be on screen, at least in my experience with him. Um, and, you know, in, in Trinidad and perhaps through, you know, the audience of your festival, people either love him or they hate him. Um, and for me, like, that's a really interesting character to, or person to, to investigate or take a, a closer look at as a filmmaker, as a storyteller. I'm interested in people like that, that evoke or um, that bring out strong opinions either way on people, especially somebody as polarizing as he is. Um, and, and to that end, I think what, what's fascinating about him is how he, how he thinks of himself in terms of, yes, he's there to, he's aware of that people are tuning in to see him, um, and some aspects of the show, whether it's entertaining or not, I'm not sure if it's entertaining. I think he's there providing a service. There are some silly moments on the show where he's, 
he is silly. There's entertainment on the show that shows like, you know, on Fridays, it, 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 there's a different tone on the show altogether. He'll bring in like, you know, artists, soca uh, singers and whatnot to perform. Um, so I, I, I don't know. Uh, it's an interesting question that he is, he's very aware that people are tuning into him and of the show aspect of the show itself. And he's also very aware that people are tuning in to see him. Um, and he's conscious of that for sure. The next question from the chat is from Montserrat and he's, this is for Sins of the Father. Uh, I guess this is about the ending. He says, the drunkard was very clever. He did die by the gun, but he made the priest pull the trigger. Awesome plot. Um, but then his confess, he became the criminal in the end. And I guess he's asking, is he about to commit suicide? <laughs> uh, I would say that's up to you, the viewer. Um, yeah, it, it's really up to you. On the day, I will say on, on the day of shooting the film, um, the, original, the original script um, was supposed to end differently, but again, COVID, right? Um, but the way it was supposed to end is when the priest um, does shoot the ex-convict, the congregation arrives just in time for church. And there's this image of them walking in and you see the priest standing up there. Um, but on the day, um, Damien, um, when we had, I think it was like over lunch, the lunch period or something, he, he pulled me aside and um, he, he suggested the idea of the priest going back to the pulpit and um, kneeling and, and you know, saying that line. And I loved it so much. I'm like, yeah, let's, let's shoot that immediately. Um, and we left it open because, I don't know, I mean, what would you do? What would you do? I mean, you, it, it really is a, a conflict between a sacred oath and, you know, your, your personal feelings towards your wife and child. So that's why, you know, in my, in my, in my first answer, I said that it, it put questions to me because I don't expect everybody to be a priest and have the same story, but we all go through these moments in life where you have to you know, way two options that are both valid and you have to make some really hard decisions. So, um, you know, it's not the first time here and I question everybody wants to know, did the priest kill himself? You know, did he, you know, did he, did he do it or did he not do it? And um, yeah, it's open because I, I, I also don't know. So feel free to, to put an answer in there. Yeah, I think you did a good, made a good choice in leaving it open. Yeah. Uh, the next question, part of it was answered in terms of uh, has the crime rate improved? Uh, this is in terms of uh, party done. And the other part of the question is, he says, it's, it's thrilling to see this done apparently live and at high risk. What precaution did the filmmaking team take in some of the more dangerous scenes? Nothing. I mean, you know, frankly, Ian Allen and was, was our safety. Um, I, you know, he, we tried to keep our distance from the main action that was happening as much as we could, but we held back a little bit. If the cops were going forward, we were, you know, I think a safe distance away from them. Um, but it was definitely, we were in some tough situations. Um, when if there was that scene where we're sort of in a, we're outside of an apartment complex uh, in a really difficult location. And even Ian was, you know, he mentions he's, he feels uncomfortable. This is a, this is a bad part, it's a bad area. And when that happened, I was like, okay, maybe, maybe this is a tough part. And he refused to get out of the car. Like he wouldn't even get out there himself. Um, so if he's not willing to go and take that, you know, take that risk with him, you know, having his, his own firearms and having a bulletproof vest, then we're kind of sitting ducks in that, in that car with him as well. Um, luckily, again, we were, you know, he works with the police so that we do have police with us, but that's not to say that anything could have happened at any moment during the production of, uh, of that film. Yeah, I'm not seeing any more questions uh, until we do. Uh, could you just speak to what you're working on next, Ian? Um, yeah, sure. So I, uh, we just wrapped a uh, production on the feature film version of Doubles with Slight Pepper. Um, we, we shot mostly, the film is, uh, I, I can't, I, I, I feel weird if I go into it because the film's not finished. Um, but I would say it's primarily set between Canada and Trinidad. And we filmed in Canada, you know, back in, in the winter. 
and we filmed um, you know for about a week in Trinidad last uh, last month. So we're officially wrapped right after um, I'm spe- I'm done speaking with you all. I'm back to the edit room and, and working on the uh, working on the edit of the film. And this is the same cast that that's coming back. Uh, yeah, there's been yes, yes, largely it's the same uh, it's the mm-hmm. same father and son. And they right. are, oh my gosh, they have, Errol C. Tahal is, you know, in, in my opinion, I think the greatest actor ever to come out of Trinidad, in my opinion. Mm. And he's, I feel he's like, he's a national hero. He's a natural, he's a national icon. And when you, when people see the work that he does in this film, it's just, it's, it's, it's really good. I think he's, you know, it's, this is definitely, a, in my mind, award-winning performance mm. that he gives. He's just, he's going to break everyone's heart. He's incredible. And Ezra, what's, what are you working on next? Uh, well, the, the script I had archived be, before COVID, um, that one is now possible to shoot now that the restrictions have lifted. Um, so that one focuses, and I, I guess it's interesting that, that Ian is just talking about crime because that focuses on crime, but um, it's titled Belmont 1993. Um, and it it, it analyzes crime from way before it starts. So it, it deals with, uh, spoilers here, I guess, but it deals with um, a father and, and his son and the way that kids are introduced into this world of crime and how they grow up into it, because it's, it's really a cycle, right? You know, Ian was, was kind of touching on that because all of the work that, you know, happens with, um, you know, crime watch and that stuff, like Ian just said it, like the, the statistics don't reflect that you know change happening and i think it's because we, we are only tackling it after the fact but you know at, at that point it's just too late you're just kind of sweeping up the mess we have to kind of deal with it at the root so belmont 1993 deals with it at the root yeah all right well we're looking forward to both of you um continuing to bring more awesome work and we look forward to having you at future editions of the festival um, and we want to thank you again for being with us tonight um, and sharing with us the behind the scenes and the background to your films. Uh, thank you to the audience for tuning in. So thanks again and have a good night. Bye. Thank, thank you, you so much, Shane. Thank you. Have a good night. Bye, everyone. <laughs>